Hello, everybody. Welcome to this week's edition of The Verdict, where we will concentrate solely on the Qatar Goodwood Festival. We had some tremendous racing from Tuesday through to Saturday. I've picked out six races of particular interest. We could, of course, pick plenty more than that. But uh, these six are of interest because of the course track sectionals that we will use to put the races into their full context. Let's start with the Sussex Stakes, the big Group 1 that took place on Wednesday afternoon. And this was how they bet. Uh, Poetic Flair was 11 to 8, the head of the market after his St James's Palace Stakes romp. Alcohol Free, well backed, 7 to 2. Snow Lantern, 6 to 1. And Drifter from 9 to 2. And Lope Fernandez, 11 to 1. A mile then on ground described as soft, good to soft in places. And that was to be the theme throughout the meeting. Easy conditions. And that has to be factored in when we look at the course track sectionals. Let's send them on their way then in the Qatar Sussex Stakes. And remind you that Alcohol Free was the winner from stall nine, Poetic Flair from stall two, finished in second place. And Snow Lantern was third uh, from stall number five and endured a troubled passage under Jamie Spencer, who was replacing the suspended Sean Levy. Alcohol Free is out wide at this stage, looking for cover and a little bit keen in the Jeff Smith colours, just tucking in, in behind Poetic Flair. She's right in there, just tucked in at that stage, trying to get cover Oshin Murphy, trying to get her settled. And the reason he's got to try and get her settled was the early pace was not frenetic. It was pretty steady until the sixth furlong and that's when it really picked up. But the course track sectional show us that they crawled really early on for about two and a half furlongs. They were going no gallop at all. And then when they got to the sixth furlong they went 11.57. That's where it really picked up and they started to race. Note the grey horse, Snow Lantern, stuck in traffic, and she'll be in traffic for a good while now in behind, and probably needs marking up. She could have finished a little bit closer. Maybe connections ruining the fact that they didn't run her in the Nassau Stakes, but they rolled the dice, and they took on the boys, and she's run re really well. Here's alcohol free towards the outside of the field, a trouble-free passage under Oshin Murphy, about to pick up and come home through the last three furlongs in 37.35. That's a pretty good effort from her in the conditions. She's a fast filly, she's effective at seven furlongs, she's got to turn her foot, and she was too quick for Poetic Flair in second place. And she's gone by him pretty comfortably. He's rallied quite well in the closing stages, but he cannot peg her back. There's Snow Lantern out now, running on quite well late on, and would have pushed for second place, I think, if she'd got a decent run at it. But she just couldn't get out when Jamie Spencer wanted an out, and she's a little bit unlucky. Alcohol Free was just too fast on the day, and I think two things were very much in her favour. One, the ground conditions. I think soft ground really suits her and brings out the best in her. And two, that this wasn't a real stamina test. It was a bit of a test of speed because of that early crawl and then they wound it up after that. But she's a quick filly and she was just too quick for Poetic Flair. Now what of him? Was he below par? I think he was a little bit below par. And my reasoning for that is the ground. The St James's Palace Stakes, his romp there was on very quick ground off a strong gallop. Here he's got slow ground and a steady gallop. Those things have really mitigated against him, I think, on this particular occasion. The winning time, 142.83, not particularly flash, just an okay time, and that's because of that steady early gallop. One horse I'm just going to upgrade, Space Traveller. Keep an eye on Space Traveller, held up, ridden to maybe make the frame perhaps, but the fifth and sixth furlong of this race, he was the quickest. He's clearly flashed his ability in this race, and there'll be more to come from Space Traveller. So what do we do? What, how do we sum this up? Well, it was definitely a career best for Alcohol Free, back on soft ground. A time form time figure of 119 tells us all we need to know about that. It was a very good performance from her. It wasn't an end-to-end -end gallop, but the pace did pick up at halfway. That's six furlongs where they really started to get going, and it did turn into a dash thereafter. She finished her race off well, despite being keen early on. She was really quite free under Oshin Murphy until he brilliantly got her in behind horses and got her settled. So that she finished her race off well is real credit to her, given that she used up a bit of petrol in the first two furlongs. Poetic Flair, he didn't have the conditions or the gallop to suit, 
Uh, I think he ran very well indeed. Some would say perhaps he didn't handle the track as well. You could perhaps factor that in, but I'm more inclined to blame conditions and the steady gallop. The winner could go for the International at York. Entered in the Sprint Cup too. The Moy Glare, I understand, is a possibility as well uh, in Ireland. 10 furlongs in the International, ooh, not too sure about that. I think a mile on soft ground is probably about as far as she wants to go. Let's upgrade Space Traveller, that fifth and sixth furlong that he fired from the back of the field. They're pretty good. They showed that he's in, he's in quite good nick and dropped down in grade. They'll be erasing him before the end of the season. But alcohol free, another winner for Andrew Balling, who's having a stellar season. Time to have a look at the Nassau stakes and now, fillies and mares. And, uh, well, Snow Lantern didn't run, but uh, Odaria did. And uh, she was a 94 joint favourite with Joan of Arc for Aidan O'Brien. Lady both up in there at 100 to 30. Arguably a bit unlucky in the Falmer stakes. Zayada, 7 to 1. Nines Empress Josephine, Technique the Outsider, at 33 to 1. Let's have a look and see how this race unfolded. You want to watch stall five for the winner, and that is Lady Bothorpe, who beat Zayada from three and Joan of Arc from stall four. We'll let them jump and have a look at how this race unfolded. It was a steadily run Nassau stakes. It didn't pick up until just about halfway. They went really steady early on. Uh, Lady Bothorp tucked in. She's second last at this particular point, travelling strongly throughout this race and she shows a bright turn of foot to win and proving that she stays 10 furlongs as well. The pace being made by Joan of Arc in the early stages of the contest, who ran pretty well. Two minutes 8.94 was the time. Not too bad a time, um, but the finishing speed percentage tells us that they really did crawl along early, 111.53%. So Lady Bothorps come home really strongly, 11.53% quicker through the final three furlongs and she ran the rest of the race, showing a bright turn of foot. The disappointment in the race is sat last at this stage. That's old Daria, the 9-4 joint favourite. Uh, remember she won the, the Breeders' Cup last year and she ran very well at Royal Ascot on her return to action. She was a bit keen, I think she wanted a better gallop to go at. She was just reefing and pulling in behind in last place. Uh, she was positionally compromised and she probably used up a little bit uh, too much energy in the early part of the contest. Here's Zayada in the Shadwell colours, cruising up into contention. The pace is now lifting and it'll lift to a final three furlongs for the winner of 34.97. So they really have sprinted home in the last three. Zayada probably just about going best, but Lady Bothorp has got dead aim on her. Towards the outside, Kieran Schumark, he can go where he wants here. He knows he can angle to the outside. He's not going to get trouble in running. And she really picks up in impressive fashion. Odaria trying to follow her through. She can't go with her. And Lady Bothorp now quickens in tremendous style. Her eighth furlong was 11.21 seconds. She really was motoring in those final three furlongs. A steadily run race, she's shown a bright turn of foot and she's one good looking, she's one going away, Zayada sticking to the task, Joan of Arc not running too badly in third place, but Lady Bothorp was much the best, this is an impressive performance, despite the final time not being that flash at 28.94, but it was the turn of foot that she showed that was really, really impressive, and those final three furlongs were very good indeed. Tremendous result for William Jarvis and for Kieran Schumark, William Jarvis has gone through a, a barren spell really, for a good while, but he's bounced back here. He's stuck to the task. He's carried on regardless, and he's got his reward here with a really good filly. And Kieran Schumacher, he's been through the mill as well with uh, issues that have been well documented, but he's back now, and, and when he was interviewed afterwards, he came across as being incredibly professional. He's sorted himself out, and all he was looking to after this race was to doing it again, getting another group one in the bag. He's a very ambitious young lad, and I think he really is going to be going places in the future now that he's got himself uh, sorted out. This was a, an impressive performance from uh, Lady Bothorp. I don't know what would have happened if Snow Lantern had turned up. It would have been interesting to see how she would have got on for she beat Lady Bothorp, of course. So how do we sum up uh, the Qatar Nassau Stakes? Well, it was a steadily run race. Finishing speed percentage 111.53. That tells us all we need to know about how steadily it was run. And that's certainly inconvenienced to Daria. She wasn't at her best anyway, I don't think, but the pace did not help her. 
Course track sectionals that show that the pace increased at the six furlong pole, so they've crawled early on. They went pretty steady for about three and a half furlongs, and then the pace picked up. Winner's final, three furlongs. Impressive, 34.97 seconds came home very strongly. And to put that into context, that was a lot quicker than any other horse in the race. And Lady Bothorp, now she's definitely opened up her options, hasn't she, going forward? I think she's proved that she stays 10 furlongs. She's effective at a strongly run mile as well. Now that they know she stays 10, they've got uh, plenty more places to go with her. And William Jarvis and Kieran Schumark, certainly the feel-good story of the Qatar Goodwood Festival, as far as uh, I am concerned. Both overcoming adversity and both winners this week. Time now to watch what I thought was the best performance at the Qatar Goodwood Festival from the best horse that we saw all week. Now, that's somewhat a, a controversial statement, but I think the best horse we saw all week was Baid. It was the two to five favourite to win the Bonhams Thoroughbred Stakes. It's just a group three over a mile, El Drama 11 to 1, 11's tactical and 12's and bigger the rest. And it was Baid in a romp. He is a monster. He really is a brilliant racehorse, this fellow, being brought along very steadily by William Haggis, but he's a Group 1 horse in the making. He jumped from stall two. He beat El Drama from five and Tasman Bay from stall number eight. Let's just see exactly what he did to this field here. Now, if you were just to analyse the course track sectionals and the final time and not know really what this horse is capable of, you wouldn't be that impressed. It was an, just an OK performance on the clock. One minute, 41 point two seconds is just all right but the way this horse travels the way he goes about his job i think marks him out as being a top class performer we first highlighted him here on the verdict when he won at leicester when he took his maiden there and we suggested that he might be a group one horse in the making well now i'm not suggesting it i'm damn sure that he is a group one performer there he is in the shadwell colors he's just got one horse behind him and what's so impressive about what he does here is how easily he makes his ground and how easily he goes past his rivals and they're no mugs these rivals el drama and tasman bay are good horses in their own right if only group three level but he absolutely destroys them watch him make up his ground here his sixth furlong, really impressive. 11.26 he fired in his sixth furlong. That was really, really quick. And he did it with hardly coming off the bridle. There's more to come from this horse when he's asked for more, when he's against better horses, better rivals, pushing into better things. He was, it's a good performance, this. Last three furlongs, 36.08, but he was geared down late on. And you can see there, he's just gone through the gears without Jim Crowley doing anything. He surged past his rivals, he's fired that quick furlong and he's come home very strongly just under a hands and heels ride and he could have gone quicker and he could have won by further. He's a real, real bright prospect, this fella. We'll surely see him in a group one before the end of the season. Maybe the QE2 at Ascot, that could be for him. The ground will be pretty soft by then, but uh, William Haggis will decide. Possibly the celebration mile next, that's maybe where... He would go with him. He did say, interestingly, when he was interviewed afterwards, that you know, racehorses are for racing, which is good for us because we're going to see a fair bit of this fella, I think, if, if he's true to his word. And there's going to be a lot more to come. The finishing speed percentage, 105.18. So he's finished off just over 5% quicker than he ran uh, the rest of the race. So those final three furlongs were pretty quick. And that one single furlong that I highlighted, 11.26, was way too hot for his rivals. They could not cope with that. I think he's a, a superb prospect, this horse, and uh, we've got to keep a, a close eye on him going forward. Um, when I mentioned those last three furlongs of 36.08, let's put that into context. The next best in the race was Perotto, who was 37.33, nearly a second and a half slower than Baid through the last three furlongs. And that just contextualizes how quick this horse was in the closing stages without being given a hard race. I think he's been brilliantly campaigned by William Haggis, this fella, and he's a potential superstar in the making. I think he's one of the best horses around. He wouldn't have been out of place in the Sussex Stakes. Wow, that would have been good, wouldn't it, if we'd have seen him up against uh, alcohol free. But William Haggis doesn't want to push him into the deep end just yet to bring him along very steadily. Even pace produced a finishing speed percentage of 
5.18. He's capable of running um, a lot faster and a lot better in a strongly run race. He's got a sharp turn of foot. That's uh, what signals him out as being a Group 1 horse, I think. The sixth furlong of 11.26 when he surged past his rivals was really impressive. Celebration Mile, I think that's where William Haggis wants to go with him. Possibly a Group 1 at, at the end of the year and uh, hopefully we'll see him next year as well. The patience that William Haggis has shown in campaigning this horse uh, has been exemplary really. He's brought him along really steadily, four successes on the bounce now. He's not overfaced him, the horse is enjoying what he's doing. Mentally he's in the right place, physically we know he's really good. And Sometimes if you overface them too soon, then they go downhill and they regress. And all this horse is going to do is get better and better. He's a superstar. Here on The Verdict now, we're going to have a look at the Unibet Golden Mile that took place on Friday afternoon. And it was a, a good looking race on paper, a classy looking handicap. Five to two favourite and very well backed all day. Path of Thunder, 13 to two magical morning. Ross Collin, 13 to two. Johan 15 to 2 and Maidani in there at 8 to 1. Typically, this race was dominated by horses drawn low. The winner, as we send them on the way, is in the Shadwell colours. Maidani from 5. Roscollin from 8 was second. Escobar from 9 was third. Johan was fourth from 2. And an eye catcher, a racing TV tracker horse for you from 19. Bedouin Story finished in fifth place. That was some effort from him, having been wide throughout the race, and more of him a little bit uh, later on. Path of Thunder was most disappointing. He was keen. He's against the rail there in the Godolphin blue with the white cap in the headgear. Um, he was very impressive when he won at Newmarket uh, prior to this, and he had the, the perfect sit just in behind Shalir, the leader, the grey horse. But he didn't pick up. I'm not sure he quite liked uh, the hurly-burly of a a big field and being stuck down on the inside at Newmarket he was always in the clear and, uh, and he did what he wanted but here it just didn't pan out for him whatsoever. Maidani in the Shadwell colours in about sixth place there and behind him Ross Collin just tracking him through the black cap the orange sleeves he's not going to get the clearest of runs in the closing stages and was perhaps a little bit unlucky but Maidani ridden patiently for a change he's often ridden quite prominently but he's just dropped in behind the leaders on this particular occasion now he's looking for running room in the striped Shadwell cap but once he gets out he runs on really well now this was a strongly run race horses in front are starting to come back he's found a gap down against the rail and away he goes meanwhile Ross Collin is having to look for room and eventually he has to switch and he loses a little bit of momentum now he's tracking Maidani through on the rail and he'll run on to his credit very strongly in the closing stages this race, the final time was 140.49. So let's put that in context. 140.49, Baid was 141.2. So this is 1.29 seconds quicker, this race, than Baid. That's because this was really strongly run. They went hard from the offset, and it was all about getting the trip and seeing it out well. Last three furlongs, only 37.12. They were slowing down and getting tired late on because they had gone such a good gallop. Nonetheless, Maidani was game and tough. Ross Collin was good as well. His best efforts of his career to date, I think, by some way. And there might be more to come from him as well. Bedouin Story, he's in the Godolphin blue, right out wide. I said he's a racing TV tracker horse. I stand by that. The fifth furlong, 11.38, fastest in the race. The sixth furlong, 11.45 fastest in the race. That's doing it out wide as well. He gave away loads of ground turning in. Now he's not the most straightforward of racehorses. We saw that when he was racing at uh, Maidan. He did manage to win out there, but he's a bit of a tricky customer who needs delivering late. But he was undoubtedly compromised by stall 19 on this occasion, and you can mark him up. Maidani and Roscollin, well, they're top-notch handicappers. Uh, they can easily cut it at a listed level, you would have thought, and there's going to be more to come from, from both of them. Particularly, I think, Ross Collin, who just had his momentum stopped. I don't think he'd have won if he'd got a clear run, but it certainly didn't help him uh, at all. So let's sum this race up then, this Unibet Golden Mile handicap. It was very strongly run. That's the first thing to say. It was a competitive handicap on paper. It lived up to what you saw in the form book, and it will be very strong form this going forward. Quick final time, 
149 compared to Baid, 141.2. Now that, that's not to say Maidani would beat Baid if they met in a race, but it's just telling you how the races were run. Ross Collin, sectional upgrade. He was faster through furlong seven and eight than the winner. So the second last furlong and the final furlong, he was quicker than the winner. So he really could have been closer if he hadn't been hampered. Very strong form, you've got to follow it. There's lots of horses to take out of the race, I think, particularly perhaps Bedouin's story. If he gets everything going his way next time up, he'd be a horse to be with. Winner runner up, they're very useful milers. There's no doubt about that. This is a really strong race. They could cut it at listed company, possibly group three company, a really top notch handicap. There you go, stick him in your track, a Bedouin story. Um, I know he's a bit of a tricky customer. He might just worth being with next time up in a, in a decent handicap where he can get some cover and a better trip. The big race on Friday was the King George Qatar Stakes. Five furlongs was the trip and it saw Batash return to his favourite venue. He was looking to win this race for the fourth time and he was two to one. Dragon symbol five to two and four to one art power. Swayza seven to one. Sixteens and bigger the rest. And uh, well, unfortunately, it's the last time we're ever going to see Batash because he was retired after this, after an illustrious career. The race went to Swayza from stall number seven, Francois Rowe, the trainer, trains uh, this filly Dan in Po in southern France. Dragon symbol second from 11, glass slippers from five third, and Arecibo fourth from stall number 12. Send them on the way here. What did we see in this race? Well, what we saw was a few interesting things, really. One, they wanted to eschew this stand side rail. And evidence of the meeting from Tuesday to Friday was that you really wanted to be on the rail. That's where you wanted to make your challenge or where you wanted to race. But they wanted to come uh, down the middle. They went very hard early on. They went a very strong pace. And Batash, on the left-hand side of your screen, the Shadwell colours, he was up with that really strong pace. And importantly, they were running into quite a strong headwind as well. So they've gone overly hard into a headwind. And it has set up beautifully for Swayza, held up by William Buick, now angled to the better ground towards the stand side. And then she quickens up really well to pick up the tiring front runners who've done far too much in the early part of the race. And she'll stay on too strongly for Dragon Symbol, who, like Swayza, had got a little bit of cover. Glass Slippers got cover too. She's on the far side. She's making a seasonal reappearance, the Abbey winner. She's run on quite well uh, late on. But this is a very good filly, this winner. But she did get the perfect setup. So whilst I think she's a massive player for the Nunthorpe at York and for the Abbey, which I think is her ultimate target, I'm not going overboard about this performance because I think everything dropped her way. She's clearly well thought of. She went off nine to four favorite for the Commonwealth Cup at Royal Ascot where she disappointed. That was a stiff six. This is five furlongs with a bit of dig when they went very hard. And I think that suits her uh, ideally. Final three furlongs at 34.12 seconds. It's about what you would expect, really. That's what she was able to fire. Uh, the fourth furlong was the quickest. That was her. She fired a 10.98, so the penultimate furlong was pretty quick. That's where she's quickening up there, from the two to the one. And when she got to the one, uh, she then came home a little bit slower than that, but you'd imagine that that would always be the case. Finishing speed percentage, 104.37%. Uh, percent. So what happened in this race was that they went bonkers early on. They went really, really hard. She was sensibly dropped in, got cover, brought to the best part of the track to challenge, and she ran away and won pretty comfortably, ultimately. She's a, the, the new sprinting queen, I think you can say. Um, Batash, well, unfortunately, we will see him no more. There was a lot of debate immediately after the race whether they should roll the dice uh, one more time, but he's had a fantastic career, and uh, they've decided to draw stumps as far as he is concerned. But he was compromised a little bit by that fast pace and, and running into a headwind and, and going head to head with pace setters early on. So they went off too hard, they're into a, a strong headwind and it really did set up for a horse that was ridden the way Swayza was. Change of tactics, yeah, I think it was a very sensible, sensible change of tactics from the row team and uh, William Buick rode her very well. He's riding at the top of his game at the moment. She got the ideal setup and Buick made the most of it. Stand side advantage. I think it did help the winner uh, to a degree. I don't want to take anything away from her. She's brilliant. She's really, really good. And she could turn out to be one of the best sprinters we've seen for a long time. However, she was helped here by getting the perfect setup and coming stand side. 
He's retired, yeah, he's gone now. We won't see him again. A scintillating career. He won 13 races, including four Group 1s. At, at his best, uh, he was an absolute rocket. The winner, well, she's entered in the Nunthorpe. That would be an obvious target. A quick five uh, York, and particularly if there's been a bit of rain around, I think that would be uh, where they'd probably go with her. But ultimately, the, you know, the Abbey is the, the big target, I think, for Francois Rowe at uh, Longchamp. Five furlongs there, where you've almost guaranteed cutting the ground. Uh, that's her game. And now they've found out how to ride her, there might be more to come. Well, last week here on The Verdicts, I highlighted a brilliant ride by Oshin Murphy to Sandan, where he rode uh, other jockeys to sleep from the front. I'm going to do that again here now. Uh, he's at it again, Murphy. Uh, it was in the Queen's Plate, the glorious stakes on Friday. It was over a mile and a half, and he was on Passion and Glory, the winner, who was 2-1. to one. Outbox 5-1, to 11-2, Yuk and Glen, without a fight, 7s and 8s and bigger. The rest, the important non-runner was Mogul. He'd have been vying for favouritism, dropped in grade. He was pulled out on account of the soft conditions. And the big question coming into this race was, was Passion and Glory going to stay? Not really a mile and a half horse, and all the evidence that we had in the form book, he'd won very impressively at Ascot prior to this. Would he stay? Well, I think he won, but didn't stay, if that makes sense, because of what Oshin Murphy did. Let's have a look. He came out of stall nine in the Godolphin Blue for the Saeed Bin Saror team. He's beaten Yuke and Glen. What a season Yuke and Glen's had. He jumped out from stall number five, and Foxtail came from stall four. And what Murphy's decided to do on a horse who they didn't know would stay a mile and a half, particularly in these conditions, was that he was anxious to do what he wanted out in front. He wanted to go the pace he wanted, and the pace he wanted to go was as steady as possible. Now he's angled across, he's got to the front, and he's just rating this horse down according to the course track sectionals. He's trying to go as steady as possible and save as much fuel as he can for the closing stages. It was very, very steady in the early stages of the race. The first four furlongs, uh, they crawled along. For example, the seventh furlong, they went 14.16. Murphy was really, what do they say in America? Walking the dog out there. He was going as steady as he possibly could. He then picked up thereafter in the home straight, gained a bit of an advantage, and then was clinging on a little bit late. But this was tremendous stuff. To get this horse to win at a trip that I don't think he stays was a brilliant effort from Oshin Murphy. You can Glenn, well, he's out the back. He's always held up, and he was compromised in terms of his position. That's how they usually ride him. But he needs a stronger gallop to go at Yukon Glen. Remember when he won at Sandown last time? They went bonkers up front and he picked them up late and ran on strongly up the hill. This wasn't for him, this steady early pace. He really needed them to go a bit harder early on. I'll give you the last three furlongs. 38.01 for the winner. He's in front. 37.42 for Yukon Glen. So he's come home through the last three furlongs much quicker than the winner. But he spotted him, what, four, five lengths in the early part of the race and just couldn't make that distance up uh, late on. But he's run an absolute blinder, Euclid Glen. Now, Passion and Glory, the 10th furlong was 12.02. That's when Murphy really wound it up. But he still had two furlongs to go. And those two furlongs were slow. He was getting slower and slower after that furlong. Second last furlong, 12.58. Then 13.41 for Passion and Glory. He's absolutely on fumes in the closing stages, but he clings on because Yuk and Glenn just had too much to do. And despite the fact that Yuk and came home quickly, not quickly enough to gain an advantage over Passion and Glory. And that advantage had been Oshin Murphy's brilliant front running ride. Look at that, he's just clinging on in the end. That was superb from Oshin Murphy dictating out in front. Then he picked up in the home straight, nicked a couple of lengths, and then he just hoped he'd cling on, and cling on he did uh, late on. Finishing speed percentage, 106.37, so 6.37% quicker through the final uh, three furlongs than the rest of the race, and that's because Murphy uh, went very, very steady early on. If they'd gone a strong gallop here, I've absolutely no doubt that he wouldn't have won Passion and Glory. I think Yuke and Glenn would have won. He remains in tremendous form for Jim Goldie. I think he would have picked him up, but Passion and Glory is a good horse. He fired a really big time form speed figure when he won at Ascot. That was over a mile, remember. He was quick there. He looked really, really quick. He looked very good indeed. Uh, and I think he's certainly 
a group three or group two horse, but he wants to come back in trip. He wants either a mile and a quarter, which he's won at before, or a strongly run mile. I'm not sure they'll go a mile and a half again with him. And if they do, well, he's going to be incredibly vulnerable because he'll never get a setup uh, like this again, I don't think. It was brilliant from Ocean Murphy. He was at the top of his game along with William Buick, but this was, this was good from the front and he just clung on. So let's sum this up then. It was, it was just a good front running ride from Ocean Murphy. I think good underestimates it a little bit. It was brilliant. Does the winner really stay? I'm not having it. I've got a big NS next to him in my form book, not stay. Steady early gallop, yeah, it was. That's just a, just to highlight how steady it was. Could have given you other furlongs that were very similar, that were 14s, but 14.16 in furlong seven, when Murphy was just doing what he wanted out in front. He was on fumes the last two furlongs, 12.56, and then 13.41, he was getting slower and slower and slower. There was nothing in the tank whatsoever as he crossed the line. Back in trip on better ground, the winner will be seen to much better effect. I think he's, I think he's really, really useful, this horse. I think there's tons more to come from him, but he's, he's got speed. That's his major asset, and that's what they need to use. Here's an important point. He doesn't really stay. He had a hard race. He still managed to win. Congratulations to Saeed bin Suran landing the glorious stakes. But he's had a hard race. He was all out in the closing stages. He wouldn't want to come out quickly again. He'd be, he'd be a, a bounce candidate for sure if we saw him quite quickly. So the pause that refreshes and Passion and Glory will be back. That's it for this week's verdict. I hope you've enjoyed looking back at uh, those six races. Baid uh, was the superstar. We said goodbye to Batash and perhaps we saw a new sprinting queen. Thank <laughs> you.